Oh, Sean, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, little jet lag, but making, making, mace, making Where are we yeah. coming from? Uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. So that's quite close for you, because I get a hint from the accent that maybe you're not an original Bay Area boy. Yeah, so the accent sounds vaguely Australian, which no one's really happy about, um, given I'm actually from New Zealand. So, But I blame, I blame my time in England. It sort of combines the New Zealand accent with the English accent and kind of makes it Australian, which I guess... I guess, and you know, we're, we're obviously big fans of, uh, of, of Australians and New, Zealand, uh, New Zealanders here. Uh, before we talk about your new company, which is fascinating, I, I just want to understand and share with the, with the group um, where you've come from, because your bio almost defies categorization, complexity theory, quantum physics, pole vaulting, and spying. So do you want to give us a few choice uh, bits of your journey? Uh, so, look, I, I came across to Oxford um, originally to study uh, quantum mechanics uh, and, and uh, um, self-assembled nanocircuits, um, but then realized Oxford and was a much more interesting place, and, and I thought I should do something with computers so that I could be outside pole vaulting while um, the computers were doing more of the work. Um, it turned out that the fascination for me was really trying to understand the dynamics of insurgency uh, in places like Iraq as the war was unfolding. Uh, which led me to uh, places like Central Command in the US um, and then finally um, got sick of the weather here and ended up in Silicon Valley. <laughs> a lot of people do get sick of our weather. <laughs> and, and you founded a, a few companies uh, in the intelligence space. Uh, the, the, the previous one was Quid, which I, I was a huge, huge fan of. Um, but tell us about the new business, Primer. So new uh, company with Primer, we're really focusing on the two kind of dual tasks of reading and writing. So this is kind of the next kind of frontier, I think, after we're seeing um, speech recognition, image processing, and now language understanding kind of get um, uh, taken up by the, uh, the world of deep neural nets. And so coming into that, what that means is you can start to build machines that um, create uh, words and language um, much like humans, which, of course, is commercially viable because now you can start to automate a lot of tasks um, that humans were doing reading and writing, which turns out to be actually a huge swath of uh, white collar jobs in the analyst function. In the analyst function, so is this something that will be used within sort of the intelligence services? Is that your general view about it? Yeah, so we sort of picked out the first major industry for us, which is where they had a lot of text, huge amounts of data, um, a lot of analysts and um, a considerable amount of money. Um, and the US intelligence uh, industry and space was one. And we're deployed now with a number of uh, the US agencies and just uh, also now our first overseas agency as well. So it's been very, very effective in, um, in automating that first few hours of the analyst day and writing the first draft of their, uh, of their report and their briefing for the, uh, for the morning. Does that actually work? Does it? So it's interesting. So we measure precision and recall in a lot of the things right. that we're doing. And what we're able to see is, is on the recall side of the game, we're getting about a 20 to 30 point bump, right? So it's 20 or 30 percentage point improvement over what a human's doing. Um, and we're able to do that shorter, faster, and with less money. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side of that is the cost, right? You're, you're going to give up a few points of precision. Right, so generally... Do you want to just say something about recall and precision? Yeah, so yeah. precision and recall for those that aren't in the AI space is basically, if you say something's true, uh, and it is true, um, that's your precision metric. If you say something true and it's false, then that would be a, a point down on your precision. Recall is, of everything that is true, how many things um, did you actually get? Mm -hmm. And so if you... Um, you can have a very precise algorithm that, that has low recall, um, which might be useful in a financial market where you're placing bets. Um, but you know, when you're in intelligence, you actually want recall because mm -hmm. um, you know, actually knowing the known unknowns um, is, is a big part of the game. Yeah. So getting a boost in recall is probably where most of these algorithms are going to have the biggest impact of what humans are doing. But you will suffer a few percentage points of, of precision, which means that the algorithms actually have to be human interpretable, and you have to think a lot about uh, building interfaces to let humans interrogate them. Right. So, so you're you're in an intelligence application. The thing that's fundamental is catch everything that you possibly can, and then the humans are going to have to sift through, and there will be some some chaff in there. But I would have guessed you're looking at online communities and online communications. There is a volume problem, but there must also be an authenticity problem because a lot of what is online is not, is, is it fair to say, not produced by humans? Yeah, so what we saw coming into this space, sort of t t 2015, we first kind of came into this world of intelligence. Um, you saw a lot of stuff um, coming out of Russia um, right. that was um, of questionable thing. Now, this wasn't a surprise to anyone in intelligence. No one sort of woke up and, like, and went, oh my God, Russians aren't telling us the truth about everything. Um, so this wasn't a surprise. Um, and it wasn't even necessarily a, a, a massive bug because actually 
when you're playing in, in the world of propaganda, knowing um, that something has an agenda is, um, is actually a very interesting tell um, to try and understand what influence that, um, that, that operation wants to put out. So it's not that you want to throw it all away, it's just that you want to start to understand um, where it's coming from and where the information first originated. Mm -hmm. So part of the problem of, of, of understanding fake and, and real information is knowing its um, provenance. And right. so being able to track that spread and flow of information as it percolates through the different networks. And it's all linked together, it's just not hyperlinked. It's kind of like linked through an implicit structure of language and claims. Aha, uh -huh. so how do you then go and take that? I mean, that's the obvious next question. You know, your implicit language and implicit claims. I mean, the semantic complexity or fuzziness about the notion of claim is, is quite broad. So how, how are you going about to unpin that? And maybe you un unpick that. Maybe you can give us an example of, of one. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a whole kind of world uh, in, that's emerged in, in natural language understanding around um, claim detection and stance detection. And so that's basically saying, look, if we've got a, two entities and we're going to make a claim, like, you know, Azim and Sean are talking on stage, um, that would be a claim that is made. Now, we could represent that in many different ways. Azim and Sean are bantering on stage. Azim and Sean are, um, you know, talking whatever on stage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but we could also have another one saying, you know, um, Sean is uh, in San Francisco. Azim is... Um, in London talking on stage, mm -hmm. right? Now, that, that is two things that can't both be true, mm -hmm. right? Now, that would be a complex one to resolve. A simpler one would be Azim and Sean are not talking on stage. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of think of the, um, the complexity of, of the counterfactuals, right? But that starts detection, knowing whether two things agree with one another. From, from a technical perspective, we've heard a lot about, uh, about deep learning and uh, statistical methods, but what you're describing to me suggests that uh, there's that you're having to build uh, sort of what, what are called inference chains and you're reasoning over those graphs Is that what's going on? No, you're, you're, you're doing all of this with with neural nets oh, you You're are. showing a bunch of it and saying look these these agree and these disagree um, And then you know the system's able to learn from that So this this structure that comes through is how we would describe it, but it's certainly not how the machines would interpret it Okay, that now you, you you're gonna have to explain that to me in even simpler terms So so let's go back through, through that again because in my my naive view I believed it would be somehow you're you're figure, figuring out who the entities are what the relationships between them are And therefore you can see where the the sort of the chain breaks down But that's not what you're doing. So for someone who's a little bit slower than you one more time Ultimately, um, you, you've, you've got a set of supervised learning algorithms. Right. The, the, these are the same. These are different. Right. You know, figure out whatever um, features need to go through. Um, figure out the topology of the, the net. You know, by all means, tune your hyperparameters to make it kind of you know get your numbers right. Um, so coming back out, good, bad. Please learn. I guess does it get any simpler than that? <laughs> right. But how do you tackle the result, the interpretability problem for the human analyst then, if those are the methods you're using? So that comes back to original sourcing. Right. So linking the information back to where the data came from. And so when you can't have an interpretable algorithm, you've got to link back and say, here's the data where things emerged from. And then you also have to be very clear of what data it was trained on top of. So you have to kind of provide links back and say it was trained on this data. So, you know, analysts can look at that and decide if there's any biases that are contained inside of this. Mm. So it's actually, w when you're dealing with more of these black box models, where interpretability isn't there, but the performance is, mm -hmm. you then have to go back data, training, and, and connections back to source material. Um, just from a product perspective, uh, what does that, that mean for the, the analyst and what they can actually see then? So it means when you're designing these systems, you want to build full stack, right? You can solve a lot of these pieces with algorithms. You can solve them with, with better curation of data. You can also solve them with UIs. Right, and so what that means is a lot of kind of footnotes and, 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 and mouse overs that um, you know start to populate the text that you're emerging, and so you're reading this with the text down the middle and then down a side panel where you'll mouse over things and things will start to say, look, you know, this came from this, so we believe this because of this original source. Right. Yeah. And so it's yeah, kind of yeah. like analyst footnotes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fascinating, but it does it does change the nature of the product that you that you have to de deliver. Yeah, and it's also too, you want to make you know, very clear that there's a, there's a strong reason for a non-interpretable algorithm. I mean, if you can do this with a decision tree, which is very human interpretable, mm. then you're going to save yourself a lot of design overhead. And so you want to be very, very confident that the, um, the, the non-interpretable algorithm is actually going to give you a significant boost because it does place more cognitive overhead for the user. So, so the, the, one of the challenges, of course, with the decision trees is, is the complexity of managing them and maintaining them. And it's particularly the case, I suppose, where you have computational propaganda in the sense that many, many alternatives are being generated algorithmically. Is, is that something that we're actually seeing in the field today, computational 
propaganda? Yeah, so I, I think what we've seen is we come back to the sort of the, the last election, I I'd call it very low tech right. um, propaganda. It was computational propaganda insofar as humans wrote some stuff. Um, it was robots um, producing it insofar as they scheduled it every 15 minutes. And, you know, maybe, maybe there was some sort of, um, you know, changing of, of words, but that would be pretty unusual. It's, it's, it's generally humans writing right. things and things pushing out. We go forward now, and what we've seen is, is through the ability to generate language and natural language generation, you can generate all sorts of um, statements and claims and stories. Um, and it's actually easier to create ones that are false than true. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, if you look at the major kind of um, recursive neural nets that are kind of the dominant form of language generation, mm -hmm. um, those that are doing things like abstractive summarization are only getting about 70% of the claims correct. So that, that's sort of cutting edge, is, is even if you're trying to do everything correctly, you'll still make 30% errors right. if you're relying on a solely RNN-generated text output. Right. So easier to sound um, moderately smart than it is to be correct, um, which, you know, may, maybe there's truism inside of that. So when you look forward, though, to 2018 and the, the U.S. midterms and 2020, the, uh, the, the sort of next election, if that takes, takes place. Um, up, up for discussion. Up for discussion. Uh, what, do you think, uh, what do you think is going to happen in this field of computational propaganda and this sort of information war? Uh, so I think we're going to see the first um, times that we're going to get three things come out. The first is we're going to get language generation. So one of the advantages of language generation is um, you can produce literally you know, millions of, of text output. Puts, um, and then you can sort of A-B test them, right? So if, if I produce 10 different variants of a claim that, you know, Donald Trump is X or Hillary Clinton is Y, then I can see which one is most resonant. Mm -hmm. And I can see which one is most resonant for people like you, mm -hmm. based on all the targeting that I've done. So you kind of think of this as hyper, um, you know, targeted um, testing of, of language that can be A-B tested backwards and forwards. Secondly is it can be targeted into the network. So if you think about, um, you know, uh, the spread of viruses across networks, if you randomly um, seed a network with viruses, that's much less effective than being very targeted. And I don't think any of the messaging was particularly targeted into certain key nodes inside of that network. Mm -hmm. And then the final one, I think, is when you start looking at opinion dynamics and opinion formation. And what we're seeing is, you know, much like the robots, um, these crowd dynamics, if you think of it, you know, instead of birds flocking, it's people moving to different positions and sort of opinion space, then we actually can kind of like start to kind of drag people by pulling people at the fringes that start to move the center away. And so we're getting better um, scientifically at understanding the dynamics of opinion formation, which means that I think we're going to start to see the first pieces of that in 2018 as well. So there's a big ceiling of what we can do. As an do. offensive capability. Offensive. Right. Right. So all of this here is like, you know, elections were moved with very primitive technology mm -hmm. um, with a few million dollars, and it, it showed the fragility um, of, of the actual demo democratic system that we have. Um, scale that up with the new technology we've got coming online around language generation, targeting, and opinion formation, and you've got a weapon system that may render politics as we know it ineffective. Wow. So, <laughs> but let, let, let's think about where this actually happens. So the interesting, interesting thing about this battle space is that it is it, it, the... the public battle space, a civic space, is now held on a private corporation's uh, feed, uh, a news feed. So to what extent now is Facebook actually being, do you think, going to be capable of spotting what's going on and acting if they wanted to? So, so Facebook um, is not necessarily aligned mm -hmm. with truth, right? right? So, like, one of the things is like, oh, that's fake information. Well, that's probably a feature of Facebook because you like that because it, it resonates yeah. with you. It doesn't disagree with you. It doesn't confront you. So the, the kind of um, outlandish um, engagement from fake information that reaffirms extremist views could be something that's very compelling that keeps you on the platform, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It could also make you feel depressed and make you want to go and buy a holiday and click on an ad and boost revenue. Right. Secondly, if we put all the fake um, bots that are on Facebook... It's not clear that if Facebook, you know, and they're claiming around 10% um, are fake, well, that's 10% of Facebook's market cap, plus right. or minus, right. right? So now we're talking about $35 billion. So sense in alignment. Is and this is where you look at this and say, like, you know, if you're an oil company, you have to, like, claim your proved reserves. Like, social networks should claim their proved users. Right. But that brings an interesting question, which is, like, well, what is it to be human and how do you know? Absolutely. Well, we have run out of time for that particular question. Uh, I want to say a couple of things. Sean is available for a Meet the Speakers uh, 
discussion afterwards. If you do want to continue this discussion, uh, a volunteer will, at the back, will hold up the green sign and take you over, take you out there. We also have a discussion on cybersecurity and cyber warfare this afternoon on this stage. Please check your programs. Sean, it's fantastic to have you. The conversation is never long enough. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. Anyone interested, please follow Sean.